All right. Ladies, we thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll say goodbye to you till we see you again in, in spring. Then you can come back next year and practice on us again. We are guinea pigs, but I'll tell you, we enjoy it when you come and spend some time with us. And when you're our guest for the summer, it's a pleasure to have you. Open your Bibles to the book of Galatians, if you will. Galatians chapter 6. I have a couple of thoughts I'd like to share with you this morning. Galatians chapter 6 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them who are of the household of faith. I was going to read the rest of the chapter, but I'm not going to get through preaching it, so I'll just stop there, and we'll find some place along here to put the brakes on this. You know, the book of Galatians is a fantastic book, but it's a book that Paul kind of lets off steam in. In other words, his people there all in the middle of Turkey where there's so much now going on, the southern border in Libya, Syria, Every time he went back, he had three missionary journeys, and every time he went back on one of those missionary journeys, he always managed to go through Galatia because there was always a need for the apostle to come back because the Judaizers that had followed Paul had set such strong ambitions in the churches of Galatia. They were trying to reestablish the old worship, the following of the Ten Commandments, the commands of the feast, all the sacrifices. And Paul said all those things were completed in Christ. And that's all you need. But they just would not heed. They constantly began. So as a result of that, Paul said in the Galatians 1, 6, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from that called you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He said, I've been here three times. And he said, I've told you the grace of God, but you just keep getting away from it. You just keep going back and listening to these Judaizers and these false prophets that come here. So he gets a little bit strong on it. And he says in Galatians 1, 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He's saying this crowd comes in here. They don't know what they're talking about. This crowd comes in here are twisting the scriptures. This crowd comes here and says, you've got to go back to the being under the law as you once were. And I've been here to told you three times that the grace of God is sufficient in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 1.8 says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In other words, you put it strongly. He said, if they didn't come in, this crowd comes in preaching these other gospels. He said, let God's curse fall upon him. It divides itself in three sections. And I was first tempted to preach here in this particular section. But instead, I chose to go back in that particular third section. For it's important that we understand that God wants these believers, even though they're having all the conflicts, God wants them to know that something is expected of them besides just staying true and standing true to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that sixth chapter, as you probably noticed as we were reading it, it's talking about being a doer of the word. 
It's telling these saints that would have been led astray and pushed astray by all kinds of doctrine that really their responsibility is to be a doer of the true gospel, a doer of the word of God. This is not a new thing in the Bible. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You're fooling yourself if you think you can change things in the word of God, that you can alter the word of God to suit your particular purposes. The purpose of the word of God is to, to adjust you to suit your, his God's purpose. And it's important. 1 John 3, 7 says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. In other words, don't be fooled. If a man doesn't live like Christ or have a respect for Christ, doesn't intend to honor God's Christ's word, God's word, he says fooling himself. He's following some kind of a false doctrine or teaching that somewhere along the line he's picked up and has not let go of it. John, third John says, Beloved, Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, and he that doeth evil hath not seen God. But what he's really talking to us about in this particular passage, you shift here, is not the matter of show us. He said it is the matter, excuse me, I reversed that. He said it's not what you tell us, but you show us in your demonstration. You know, you can speak a good gospel, you can preach a good Christianity, but if you do not demonstrate that Christianity, if you do not walk for the world to see that Christ Jesus in you, you're not really accomplishing what God saved us for and what God has purpose for. But you know, I'm really banging on this because if there's anything that we need today, it's this kind of a people. It's this kind of a people and this kind of a church that has this kind of people in it that demonstrate not only just the preaching from the pulpits, but they demonstrate by their very life that Jesus Christ is real in their life. They do show it in their workplace. They show it in their homes. They show it in the public relationship. And so it's important. And in, those six, in that sixth verse, we had seven principles, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get to the all seven principles again. Preacher, they told me here sometimes, do you ever finish a sermon? No, I'll come, you come back tonight for dinner, and we'd love to invite all our guests for dinner. I, I won't finish it there, but I'll probably, I'll probably use it to close up. I, just be, I get a brief devotional time Sunday night, because you know what? I like to eat just like you do. And so you, I have two things in life, preaching and eating. And uh, thank God I honor the first most than to do the others. You can tell I don't shun the other either. But anyway, let's start to these things. First of all, Galatians 6, 1, it says this. He says that we have a responsibility toward one another. And he says that we have a responsibility, especially toward a brother or a sister who errs from the Word of God or errs from living the Word of God. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one under the spirit of meekness, uh, with the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know this particular thing. Notice the type of sin. It seems sometimes even Christian folks go out looking for sin, you know. They feel, well, you know, God's not looking now. I'll go out and have a good time. I'll have a few beers or something like that. And, you know, but that, that isn't what God says here. He said, if any man be overtaken in a fault. In other words, sometimes a good child of God, a sincere, honest, God-serving will get overtaken in a fault. I mean, that's, that's important to get overtaken. Uh, since we had that football game last night, and we did win, but we just barely did win. But I remember one time when I was playing football, uh, I was a lineman, so as a result, I never hardly saw the ball, you know. But one day, I looked up, and the thing was flying through the air, and sure enough, I got a hold of it. And so I knew which way the goal was, and I knew which way I was supposed to run, so I'm, I'm off. But I was big. And I was slow. And I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. And all of a sudden, the bottom fell in and the roof came in. And I fell four short, four yards short. So I never made 
a running touchdown. But here's what this is saying. You know why? Because I got overtaken. You know, they were coming after me. And I'll tell you, Satan is coming after you. The host of Satan is coming after you. The principalities and the powers of darkness and rulers of this world, they're after you. And you know, we need to run for our spiritual life. But I thank God that we're in Jesus Christ. But here it says, every now and then a brother will get overtaken. They're trying to avoid it, uh, but because of weakness or ignorance or a lack of prayer or a thousand other reasons, they get taken. So what does God say to do to them? Ignore them. Kick them out of the church. Shun them. Talk about them behind their back. No. God says, restore Restore such a one. You know, that's an interesting word, restore. It simply means it's a surgical term. Uh, I, I have Brother Jeffrey Sheldon. He's a doctor. He's not here today. He generally tries to play our organ. I didn't say that. I said he plays our organ. Okay. <laughs> he plays organ in his spare time. But, you know, uh, anyway, uh, he's the doctor. And the term is this. It's simply set in joint. In other words, if something gets broke, it's a dislocated bone. Our bones are accidentally. We don't break our bones deliberately, do we? They accidentally get broken. Well, this term, what Paul says here, he says that you uh, do this. He said you restore such a one. In other words, reset the bones. Reset the problems. Straighten up the problems and difficulties that your brother is being restored, uh, is being fought with. And he says, this is a job of ye who are spiritual. Well, watch out for that. You know, I met some that were so spiritual, they wasn't good for anything. You know, because it's important we understand. It takes a spiritual person to discern the spiritual condition of another. And I've seen where sometimes some of those that quote, unquote, spiritual brethren do more damage than they do good because they do not really and not living the life that to be. So overtaken. So 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says this, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. You know, Peter got that way one time in his ministry, remember? Peter said to the Lord, he said, Though all men will forsake you, God, the Lord, he said, I'll not forsake you. And before the night was out, and when the crow, the cock crowed three times in the morning, Peter had gone farther away from God than any of them had. So we're all subject at times to be very careful that we do not go away from God. So the responsibility is if we go away from God, or if someone goes away from God, our problem, our purpose is not to ridicule them, not to discipline, not do anything, but our purpose is to pick them up. Lift them up with a spirit of love and the truth of God's word. It's a principle that we ought to have. Every one of us ought to be praying for a brother that's fallen. We ought to be praying for a sister that is struggling with some of the hardships in the course of life. That we, if we can't lift them up physically, we can certainly lift them up to him by prayer. Because he hears us and he may answer and may use us as a tool to restore it. There's also another thought. He says in this passage, he said, be a spiritual bearer. In other words, how long has it been since you went to help a brother? How long has it been since you went out for your church to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ? How long has it been since you would said, we need a teacher in our Sunday school class? We do need some teachers in our Sunday school class. But how long has it been since you said, well, let me by God's grace, let me fill that vacancy. Let me help. You know, it's in getting increasingly difficult to find folks that are willing to take the time out of their busy lives. And your life is busy. I know it is. And the world's pressures come on to keep you busier and busier and busier. But somewhere in your life, you need to make a time for God. You need to make a place for God and for God's house. And the service in God's house. Because he says in Galatians 6 too, Bear ye one another's burdens. And so, for the live, so fulfill the law of Christ. So instead of being a discouragement, let's be an uplifter to God. Let's be a blessing to those. A guiding principle of our life should be, we are not in the world for what we can get out of it, but what good we can do in it. 
That's really why God has got us here. Not before we get out. Not he didn't tell us he's going to bless us and prosper us. He will sometimes. Thank God he will. But we also are told we're here in this world, not for the good we get out, but what good we can do for Jesus Christ in it and for his church in it. It's our method. It's what God had put us here for. So he said, Romans 15, 1, for when, for when that we are, I'll get this right, when then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Have you ever thought, are you pleasing yourself or are you pleasing God? Sometimes just sit down and think about it. Think through a day. Just take a day. Don't take a month. Don't take a week or a year. But let heaven know, don't take a year. But just sit down and take a day and say, have I pleased God today? When I got up this morning and when I walked through my day's routine, whatever it might have been, when you lay your head upon your pillow, can you just say, I please God today. God, I've done what you wanted me to do. But all too often, don't we lay our head on the pillow disturbed because we have not really? That Galatians 5.14, backing up a little bit from 6, but it says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Who's your neighbor? Well, right now your neighbor's next to you, lives in a house next to you could be any kind of a neighbor. Before we leave this point, let's just understand verse 5. Galatians, for every man shall bear his own burden. Now that's Paul speaking. What do you mean bear his own burden? His own responsibility for God. God lays a burden on all of us. Our burden is to witness for Jesus Christ. Our burden is to raise our families in Christ. Our burden is to be a witness and a living testimony. Every man must bear his own burden. So the burden of verses 2 and 5 is not the same. He said, verse 2 said, a heavy load. Of, it, verse 2 says, the heavy load of sorrow and trouble and too great to be born alone. In verse 2 of that passage. And the burden in verse 5 has to do with a personal private burden. We all have th these burdens that we're supposed to hold to. Thus we see that we are a a community type burden. As a church, we have a burden, don't we? We should have a burden, shouldn't we? A burden, first of all, for the lost, for those outside that do not know the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to be a shared burden that every one of us, in our own way, in our own capacity, said, I want to have a part of fulfilling the testimony of Jesus Christ that he came to die for the sins of the whole world. And we ought to be, have that responsibility to tell the world about us. You know, we have gotten to a place to where we say, I hope God will send somebody in today that we can preach the gospel to them. Some saved man, unsaved man that we might be able to present the gospel to. That is what Jesus said. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go outside the doors and preach the gospel. Go on your job and preach the gospel. Go to your neighbor and, and preach the gospel. So that is a burden that we have a responsibility to bear before the Lord. So if any man think of himself to be something when he is nothing, he's deceiving himself. We are really nothing and we are made something. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that makes us anything at all. Our own esteem and our own self and our own ideas and our own publication, that doesn't mean anything. But it's what Jesus knows about each and every one of us. Galatians 6, 4, here. So let every man prove his own work. Let every man prove his own work. I, I'll prove Brother Skinner's work. Brother Skinner, you do a good job. Well, I mean, I, that's nice. I'm glad I compliment. I, you ought to compliment somebody when they do a good job. But first of all, let me look at my life. Am I really serving God like I ought to be? Am I using my talents to advance the gospel of the Lord Jesus? Every man prove his own work. And then when you prove your own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself. You know, isn't it nice? To go to bed and know that you've served God today. Isn't it nice to be saved? You may not have been successful in your service to God, but isn't it nice to go to bed and say, I tried, Lord, and he knows you tried. And he wrote the book, the end of the book, but he knows that you tried. So it's so important that we understand. 
We dare not make ourselves of another number. Let's just make ourselves what we ought to be as far as Christ is concerned. He said the hypocrites do the other. There's a lot of things like that. Matthew said in 6.2, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Boy, aren't you glad you got a good preacher like me? Aren't you glad that you got me? I'll blow my I'll tell you, I'm the greatest preacher ever walked across a pulpit. God would certainly put me in an early grave for that kind of carrying on, and you know it. But oh, listen, so therefore, he said, don't sound a trumpet. Just go on and do the work that God has laid upon your heart that you need to do. And God will reward you openly. Amen. One last thought. I'm, I'm going to quit. Vanna's thought. Galatians 6.6. 6. Look at this one. Galatians 6.6. 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to communicate to you. To teach you and to challenge you to go out and do the things that you know God told you to do. Communicate. The idea is that we're to communicate God's word. And it should be a priority in everything that we say and do. Because, wait a minute. What did God say to us through the book of Acts when he said in 1.8, But you receive the power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, that you shall be witness of me in Jerusalem. Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. That's a God-given responsibility. Right now, I hope you're doing it individually. Right now, I hope that we can do it better as a church. And listen, I know that we're doing it when you look across that back wall at our missionaries. Some of them are risking their very lives in the field because of their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole Mideast is a, a terra pot. In fact, the whole world, we're not going to get any better in this world. But they're risking their very lives. So as a result of that, Jesus said, man, putting his hand to the plow and knocking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That's a pretty strong message, isn't it? Once you start serving God, once you say, God, God, I, I love you. I'm, I'm going to serve you. But, you know, serving God is an easy task. So you got your hands to the plow, boy. God, I'm going to plow for you. I'm going to do the job for you. But he said, this is hard. The ground's a lot harder than I thought it was. Man, these, these handles on this plow, they, they're giving me blisters. And so I'm just going to kind of let up. Nobody will notice. I'll tell you who notices. God knows when you let go of the plow. And men have let go of the plow. Some great men in preachers of the gospel have, have just because of discouragement actually quit when they had a whole life that they could have used for the glory of Lord. So then simply, and I close with this, verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them who are the household of faith. And you know this matter of do good to them which are of a household of faith. I know that you've noticed this in your life, but sometimes you don't comment on it or you've not really just thought about it. But have you ever noticed that when you do good in the house of God and you rejoice in doing good in the house of God, the next thing you know, you're going to be out of this house of God. And you're still going to be doing good. You're still going to give the man on the corner holding a sign that says hungry and homeless. You'll give him a dollar bill when you know he's not going to go get food with it. He's going to buy booze with it. You'll do this, but you're doing good. You know, listen, it's your heart to cop that God recognizes to do good. And so it's important that we, we do good. But we also have that responsibility that is ours to to be a testimony of the grace of God. I wish I could have finished the rest of this, but...
There's just some thoughts. And this is it. And I'll close right here. I promise you. The Bible says, you're the salt of the earth. Who's he talking to? Who is he talking to there? You're the salt of the earth, he said. It's just like God would lean over in heaven and he would say, you're the salt of the earth. Hey, you're the salt. No, no, you're the, no, what? Anyone that lives for him and loves him and has him in his heart that is tempted to serve to God, God says with all ten fingers or four, eight, how many, eight and two thumbs, he says, you're the salt of the earth. And you know, that's the benediction that we should have. That's what we see. But I notice, you do get in this church, you're going to be doing good outside. I'll never forget the first time that I had to witness to somebody. I went with a preacher, and I went with him, and I didn't know a thing about it. And so we went up, and he knocked on the door, and a man came to the door, and he witnessed, boy, I said, man. He said, I said, boy, that's great. You know, I said, that's great. I'm, I'm standing there, and I'm supposed to be praying, but I just stand there listening, really. And so, fine, we fed, we. We went, went that, that, he walked back out in the street, and he turned around to me. He says, okay, you go to that house, and I'll go to this one. I said, what? I, 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 he said, you go to the house, and I'll go to this one. I, I wished I had had something I could have said to him, but I couldn't. He said, no. He said, go. Well, I went to that house, and I knocked on the door. I said, I hope to God there's nobody home. <laughs> you know, that's the wrong attitude. But we grow in the Lord, don't we? We grow in the Lord. Then we'll come to the strength of the place. We go to the door. We knock on the door and said, man, I hope we're home. The blinds are moving. They turn the lights out inside. But boy, I hope we're home. <laughs> but what I'm trying to bring about is God wants us to live our lives for the Lord. God wants us to look at our own lives constantly and make improvements in them. Oh, we're imperfect. We'll make our mistakes. But you know, God loves us. Remember when you had your kids? Maybe most of you did. Maybe some of them didn't. But remember when your daughter or your son would come up and he'd pull a boo-boo? What would you say? Oh, you dumb kid. No, you patted him on the head and said, good job, son. Good job, daughter. You know, that's what God does for us, isn't it? But listen, we as your spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest we also be tempted. Stand with me, please. Heads bowed. Eyes are closed. You know, if you're here today and you've not known Christ as your Savior, the Lord has led you here. It's not an accident you're here. I don't know what the circumstances are that brought you into the house of God. But if you're here and don't know him, God has his hand on your life guiding you right now. Why? Because he wants you to be saved. Christ died on Calvary for the sins of the whole world, and that includes you. If you're here without him, today is the day of your salvation. If you will let the Lord come into your heart and life and save you. But it's up to you. God never forces himself into any life. But he may plead with you. He may cause things to happen in your life. Because why? Because he wants you to be saved. So you're here and say, Preacher, I've never asked the Lord to come into my heart and life. You can do it today. Because the Bible says, Behold, today is the day of your salvation. In a moment, we're going to have a verse or so of invitation to him. And if you're here without Christ, Slip out of your seat or don't even wait for the invitation to him. Come now. We'll have someone open the Bible with you and show you how to be saved, how to make your peace with God. Then, Christian, what about you? Are you serving God like you should? Are you seeking opportunities to know him and to lead others to him? I trust that you are. But you know there'd be probably some here, you're saved, you love the Lord, you've even been baptized, scripturally. But you don't have a church home. 
Maybe you left your home in the mountains of the Carolinas, and maybe they even tore the building down, but you haven't found someplace else to serve God. Well, we want to invite you to come. Now, I'm not telling you you need to come here. I'm telling you you need to ask God if you need to come here. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit's leadership. If God's speaking to your heart, one, if you need to be saved, come. If you need to join our church, we invite you to come by letter, by statement of faith, or by baptism. So as we sing and have a word of prayer, and as we sing an invitation hymn, let God speak to your heart. Father, we thank you for the privilege of preaching your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought some of these folks together into your house to lift up their voice and trust their prayers right now for anyone that might be with us that's not saved, anyone that's with us that does not have a church home. God, we're not perfect. We know that. But if you add them to us, they can help us to be what you want this church to be. And we'll thank you and praise you for that which you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen.